Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Today on the show, we have Hal Swayze. Hal is definitely a super agent. His $65 million in sales volume has earned him the rank of number 97 on Wall Street Journal's list of top producing agents. Hal, thanks for taking time out today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Toby. So Hal, kick it off a little bit and tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Um, sure. You know, I've been in the real estate business for 23 years. Um, started just kind of by accident. Um, a friend of mine was in the real estate development business. He needed some support. I knew nothing about real estate, went to work for him in 1989. And if you remember 1990, there was a recession there. So after about a year, he closed up shop. And I love the little town I lived in. It's called San Luis Obispo on the central coast of San, uh, California. Where I went to college, I was, he actually drew me back from the Bay Area where I was in a corporate sales job. And uh, so I got my license, started in real estate, started uh, very humbly to say the least. And then we'll this uh, last year, we were able to close about 140 transactions, which, as you said, amounted to 65 million. And this year, we're on track for about 100 million. I know you talked about a little bit, but, but so what was your background like, before uh, you got into real estate? And winding road, and I well, I had always, uh, I've always had a good work ethic. I worked as a kid, and then through college, you know, I would uh, ten bar, I'd teach tennis in the summer, I'd string tennis rackets, I did whatever I needed to to put myself through school. After school, when I got my degree, I moved to the Bay Area and worked for uh, an air freight sales company. So it was a Fortune 500 international and domestic air freight forwarder. So I was just basically trying to cultivate accounts, service them, um, and it was just basically an outside sales job until I got the opportunity to work back in San Luis Obispo for my friend and I'm happy to be back here in the small community where I live. Well, so you've always kind of been in sales. What, what do you think the biggest hurdle that real estate entrepreneurs have to overcome in, in building their businesses? Well, I mean, 100% honest, and a lot of people don't like to hear this, it is actually a sales business. So, you know, if you don't have customers and you can't uh, develop customers, then you're going to have a hard time learning how to solve a transaction, how to provide service, what the nuances are. So, so really... Um, you know, to be good, you, you've got to be a great salesperson, um, and, and that's that is the foundation of any uh, you know uh, any sales business. And so th that's what this is. And so if you, if you don't have sales skills, if you haven't learned to develop them, I didn't have them. You know, I had a little bit, but honestly, I've had to develop them over 23 years. Not something that came naturally. So you said something interesting. So sales certainly is the lifeblood of, of an agency like yours. And in sales, right, there's the end game, which is you close them. But you mentioned something there, uh, which is customer development. Can you unpack that a little bit? Well, uh, of course. Um, you, you know, it's very hard in real estate to just meet someone and, and boom, make a sale. Um, it can happen, but, you know, to find someone that wants to sell their house takes time. Um, and can I meet someone or get referred to someone at this stage of my business, 23 years in, where it's just like, we'd like to sell our house, we've heard about you, I come out, I list their home. That can certainly happen. But, um, you know, it's the biggest investment people have, their home normally. So they want to feel very comfortable with you as an individual to handle that transaction. Just like, you know, if I was going to get heart surgery or brain surgery or something major, I, I would want to know I've got somebody who's got some experience and has the confidence and know-how to how to solve the situation, and that's what we get paid to do, solve problems, either selling a home or helping someone buy a home. So let's try to get a little more specific on that. So, you know, in terms of customer development, you know, certainly marketing and reaching out, having your name and your, your company name in front of people, how, how specifically do you... Uh, good, good question. Yeah, you know, like any sales, uh, prospecting. So I, I didn't know a soul, so my first year or so, I would just hold an open house every weekend. Um, I got very little business from that, um, and I actually went to a, a trainer, got some tapes from a friend of mine uh, by a guy named Mike Ferry back in the day, and, mm -hmm. and he said, boy, if you want to increase the number of customers you have, you have to increase the people you speak to. So 
I started with open houses. It was the lowest impact, but it really, quite honestly, I tell me it was not that effective. So I would call on people who were trying to sell homes on their own. I would call listings of people who didn't sell. They came off the market, and I say, hey, you want to try a different agent? I would, you know, notify all the neighbors if I took a listing or sold a listing, and, and that's that was the the heart of it. And then over time, those people, when you do a good job for them, become past clients. And then I've been diligent and very religious in keeping touch with those people, letting them know that, hey, I'm not here just to help you on this one transaction. I want to be able to help you for the rest of your life and every person you come in contact with. So we want to bring that level of service. So if they think real estate, they think Hal Swayze. Fantastic. So for you in your career, you've been doing it 23 years, a long time. Was there ever a time that you felt like it was just too hard and you wanted to quit? And how did you push through that roadblock and find success? Um, it's just, I guess that's how many times a day do, do I have that thought? <laughs> uh, and I say that jokingly, but yeah, you know, there, there's always challenges in anything you do. Um, my friend's a local soccer coach here, and I thought, wow, you know, the women's team, they do well, what a cushy job. And then he tells me the story, you know, one of the parents was mad because his player didn't play. So there, there's always going to be challenges in business and always going to be challenges in life. Um, you know, my second year in the business, I, I was... Um, I wasn't broke, I was beyond broke, and I was going broke, and I almost uh, quit selling real estate. I actually applied for a few jobs, I interviewed, and I was very fortunate because in that second year, I was listening to some Tony Robbins tapes, and I, I just this one thing stuck with me, that if I took this job, I could pay my bills. And that's all I wanted, you know, that's like, that sounded great at the time, and, and, and Tony Robbins' statement, Toby, was this. He said, you can have a life by default, or you can have a life by design. And I realized if I quit at that moment, I was defaulting to just paying the bills. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And fortunately, the next year, my third year in the business was, you know, a, a good year. I sold 23 homes, made $93,000. I didn't even know that was possible at that stage of my life. I was probably 30, 31, I don't know. Um, so that, that was way beyond my comfort zone. So that was a definite turning point in my life where I could have just taken that job if they would have given it to me. And, and fortunately, I stuck with it. That's a great story. You know, Tony Robbins also, t you know, he, he throws out a challenge in uh, Awaken the Giant Within. He, he talks about, you know, he challenges you to create your life as a masterpiece. Do you think today for you, right, you've, you've, you've made very decisive actions. It's, I mean, you're number 97 with $65 million in sales, extremely successful. Do you think that that, that vision you had back then, I mean, do, could you ever then envision your life today and the success that you've had, experienced? No, honestly, three years ago, I, I didn't, I couldn't envision where I am today. It, it, you know, it's, it, it's a process to learn to set goals and take every, you know, small steps every day. And, and, you know, we heard and said we underestimate what we can do in the long term and overestimate what we can do in the short term. So, hmm. you know, I'm, I'm an instant gratification guy, but I'm very disciplined as well. So it is amazing how, and when you stick to these things, um, they can really pay off. So no, I had no concept that I could be where I am today. What do you think, Hal, is the single biggest thing that most realtors get wrong? Um, well, two things. They don't run their business like a business, and they don't take it seriously. Um, you know, it'd be like if I opened a, a restaurant and I just like, yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll open up today, maybe tomorrow. I'm not so sure what time I'll open up. You know. Um, if you're an independent contractor, it's a dangerous place to be because you're left to your own devices. There's very little accountability. We're all independent contractors. And even with the, some of the best brokers in the world, I mean, basically in, in real estate, it's like, here's a desk, a phone, good luck, you know, go sell something. So the, the biggest mistake is not treating it like a business. Um, and then I'd say, secondly, um, you know, it's, it's easy to struggle financially and then it's easy to then put a paycheck before a customer. Hmm. So keeping your reputation, making sure you do what's right, uh, that's much easier to do when you've had some success more difficult in the beginning. So, you know, th th those are two things that I see, uh, you know, in this business, agents just do not set up a plan. They don't run it like a business. They don't keep themselves accountable. They don't monitor what's happening because, you know, if, if you run out of money in any business, if my restaurant goes negative six, eight, 12 months in a row, guess what? I'm not going to have a restaurant anymore. You know, that's good. You know, one of the things that, that I hear from other really successful agents is, is something very similar, but specifically they say that, you know, a lot of uh, people starting out or, or mildly successful people, 
they want to try to do everything themselves and and they fail to grow because they're working in their business and not on their business. They fail to hire a team, you know, that they, they fail to replicate themselves. Uh, would you agree with that? And how, how do you think, how have you attacked that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I was fortunate. Again, this is through my coach, Mike Ferry, but early on I, I did get an assistant. And even though it was part-time, I realized there are certain things that I can delegate uh, that free me up to be with clients. So, um, you know, and, and then I've also seen it go the other way where, you know, I'm not to disperse on anybody, uh, cast dispersions on anyone, but I would say on that list in the Wall Street Journal and some of those others, it's me selling, and then I have a buyer's agent who is a 26-year-old rock star uh, she's been working for me for five years. So between the two of us, we do all the production. Now I can hire eight other agents and just really be a broker. But at the end of the day, that, that production is between two people. And then we have a listing and an escrow coordinator to help support us there. And we have a runner. So there's five of us, hmm. three admin, two salespersons. So yes, you, you have to realize where your time is most valued. And, and you have to get to that point where your time does have value. Because if you're really not doing anything productive, Toby, then you, you might as well be an assistant anyway and do it all. But if you get to the point where you want to grow, you have to get people to assist you and you have to delegate and you, you have to be effective with your time and, and what's a dollar productive activity. That's great. You know, I've been all over your website, Hal, and I've, I've tried to dig up and, and look at what you're, you're doing. And one of the things that I see that you're doing that is very different from, from most agents is that you have a, a .tv domain name. You have a video blog, and you seem to be pretty regular with it. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about that and how that is uh, positively impacted your business? Well, sure. You know, in, a, in an attempt, I, I'll be honest with you, I am not good at general marketing. I don't spend money in the newspapers generally. I, I've done radio advertising, and I know other people have had success. I didn't have much success in my area. I mean, most of my business comes from me talking to people, doing a good job, and training them virtually. You know, I've got virtually several thousand people that I call my sales people, and they know that if there's somebody who wants to buy or sell, I've trained them to call me. So the video blog is great because for, for, for a couple of reasons, actually. One, it's an easy way for me to reach out to, at this point, about 5,000 people. And my goal is to basically have that as a small television show. So I can make that video. It takes me two or three minutes. I try to provide information and things that are relevant of value to my clients, and I've gotten a very good response from it. Um, so it's an easy way to do that. And when I'm on the phone talking to people, and I live in an area where there's a lot of people who live out of town. So if, Toby, you had a home here, and let's say you live in Los Angeles, but you have a home here in Pismo Beach on the coast, I might say to you, hey, you're not going to sell now. Boy, would you like to be updated on the market occasionally? So if you do need that information, since your home is so valuable here, you'll know what's going on. Sure. So I capture your email address. You get my videos. I may never have to call you again. But you call me up, and I get people now that I've talked to once, and they skip my videos, and they call me up and say, boy, we're ready to go. We like what you've done. And I'm presenting to them t once or twice a month with a video blog. It's a great leveraging and sales tool. That, that, that's the first part, and not to overdo it. But quite honestly, if I'm going to have to sit in front of a camera with, I don't do it with cue cards, and make a compelling argument so somebody just clicks on it, they'll want to see it, uh, my presentation skills have to be very, very good. So I've learned a lot to be a better presenter on camera, and that's been a great tool. So it's helped my listing presentation, my presentation with my clients, and it's a great tool to get out to those people that I may not be able to talk to directly. You know, I don't want to give away any of your secrets, Hal, but you know, I, I read an article that you were quoted in uh, uh, surrounding your video blog, and uh, and in this article it said that your email open rates, um, I think they said the average for the industry was around 10%, and you were averaging... Uh, 26 or 29 percent? Yes, we have good feedback. I, I pay a company, Viral Marketing, they do a phenomenal job. I, I, virtually just my assistant sets up the camera, tells me, you know, six or finger up when I've passed one minute, two, three. We want to keep it less than three minutes. And I just have to come up with the content, and then we send the video to them and they distribute it. My job is to provide good content and keep adding people to that list who want to receive that information. So, yeah, I try to make sure it's something I would be curious about. It's something I'd be talking to a seller about on a regular basis, a buyer. And so there's a, there's a variety of topics that um, get a good open rate. But I, I think it's because what we say has value and, and the way I present it is reasonably good. Yeah, you, I, I watch a few. They're pretty compelling. So how yeah. – Three, three. You said three years ago you could not imagine the kind of success that you have today. Can you tell us about your first breakthrough deal or that that first time you got that eureka moment? 
Well, of course, it was you know 1992 when I decided to stay in the business. That was that was huge. And then um, you know there was a couple of things that I've done along the way. And uh, 2007, my children were in going into seventh and eighth grade. Two boys. I'm married. We had planned for about four or five years to take nine months and travel around the world, and we were able to do that. And that was an amazing thing that we did. In fact, I'm looking back, I'm amazed we pulled it off. That also kind of coincided with a big turn in the economy and the real estate market. So when I came back, the market had changed, and I had lost momentum after being gone for nine months. So reestablishing my business in a challenging economy was, uh, you know, that was tough. And by 2011, I got my first... uh, time I'd been trying to get over 100 closed transactions. So I did 112 transactions, made my first million dollars in 2011, when prior to that I hadn't done more than, say, 70 transactions. So kind of going away, having to reset, having to deal with a much tougher market has made me a stronger agent and in my, in, in my business, you know, hit an all-time high in a, in a pretty tough market and then the market's improved since then, so is my business and, and I'm benefiting from a stronger real estate market as well. Wait, let me, let me see if I have this right, Hal. So, so you went, you traveled the world, you came back. Uh, obviously, your business has lost momentum. You find yourself with less momentum in a tough market, and you dug in and and had your best year the next year? Is that? Is, I mean, how did you do that? that? Not, not the next year. So okay. 2008, I came back, put the kids back in school for a month. But, you know, I... I you know, I was spending more money than I was taking in for, I mean, my business broke even when I traveled. I had a young man kind of keep a few deals going, paid one assistant I had at the time. I came back, I was losing money. I virtually had to restructure with my that assistant at the time. And she said, no, I, I'm not going to restructure. I'm going to step away. So I brought on a, I had a part-time person working here. I said, you want to be full-time? She said, yeah. So the next year we did mm, maybe 40 transactions. That was 2009, 2010. We probably did 65. Then 2011, which was kind of par for the course for me. You know, I do 60 to 70 transactions a year. I don't. Uh, that's probably 30 to 40 million in income or in uh, gross sales volume. And then 2011 was when I had the first breakthrough, and that's when we did 112. Last year we did 140, and this year we're on track for about 180, 185. I don't want to get off into the weeds here. So 09, you did. Uh you did, I think, I think you said 60 or 40 transactions. Were those, did you transition uh, into short sales at that time? Or how, I mean, that's, a, I mean, that is the, 09 was really, really bad. Um, yeah, we did a few. We did a handful of short sales. Um, we were stumbling along trying to figure them out like everybody else. But uh, no, I never got in big in the REO business, fortunately, because that came strong and then left yeah. as fast as it got here. Um, but no, it's just conventional buyers and sellers, and uh, you know, and and again, it just tells me even after at that point I'd been almost 20 years in the business when I left, uh, how important it is to get out there and reach out to people every day. Because if I don't do that, um, the business will dwindle. Right. Well, how, have you ever had a super agent or superstar moment where you where you felt like you've arrived? Um. Uh, yeah, well. Um, I mean, just the last two or three years have been good years. I've always tried. I've probably spent eight or nine years going, okay, I'm going to do 100 sales this year. I'm going to do 100 sales. And, and I just failed and failed and failed. I was moving forward most of the time, some years back. But, you know, going over that threshold was a big deal because that's the first year. I, 2011 was the first year I ever hit my goal. And for me, you know, just honestly, it was working on taking listings because I was always limited to about 60 listings I would take a year, which would usually equate to about 60 sales. And I said, I've got to get to 100 listings if I'm going to do 100 sales. And, and virtually for every listing I take, I will sell a house. I actually sell more than a house. But So it was getting over that hump. So that would be 2011. Wow. So 20 years into it, you finally right, met your goal. So it only took me two. I was a slow learner. I'm still am. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so earlier you said that you were a disciplined person. How yeah. do you stay productive and focused on a day-to-day basis? Well, um, you, you know, the mindset is critical in this business. I mean, sales is a numbers game. So, you know, I have to get a lot of rejection for me to get one sale. And you know what? I've learned to deal with that. Very hard for me at the beginning. Didn't like prospecting, calling people up out of the blue, cold calling, calling expired listings. To me, it just felt wrong. I, I felt bad. I had to mentally get over that. So I do a lot to work on my mindset and my mental toughness just by reading good books about inspiring people. I'm very um, disciplined in my exercise. Um, and, and probably the biggest thing I've done the last four or five years is hang around people that are doing more than I'm doing. Because in a small town, it's easy to be a big fish. 
but that's limiting. Um, so I, I, I looked around the country and I network with agents who were doing a lot more than I was, which made me uncomfortable, but also made me grow. So it raised what I was comfortable with, and that's been the biggest, I, I would say mentally the biggest thing, is just hanging around people doing more that you can do because they know, they look back and go, geez, I did it, you can do it. I mean, I see other agents, I go, I, I don't know what's stopping you. I, I mean, I went through the same thing, I get it, but get the blinders off, get the limiting thoughts out of there, and just go for it. Yeah, that is, that is a great, great lesson. And Jim Rohn says that, that uh, you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. And uh, I mean that is always a challenge for all of us to 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 reach up and uh, hang sure. around or spend time with people more successful than us. Yeah. What do you think, Hal? Is is the biggest lesson you've learned in your business selling real estate? Um, you know, there's a certain amount of business maturity that comes with time. So, for me, I, I am in a small town. I mean, San Luis Obispo has forty thousand people. Uh, currently, there's 100 active listings. Now, that's not my home market because I'll serve other towns, but the community itself is small. And if I represent a seller and another agent represents a buyer, Toby, that's great. And uh, But at the end of the day, I can't be so one-sided as to just, you know, irritate someone or treat someone unfairly. So, you know what, I, I treat, uh, you know, obviously I have a, a duty to represent my clients the best possible. But I think business can be done fairly so that all parties, you know, win. And there's going to be little bumps in the road and people get upset that, you know, somebody got the refrigerator and I wish I would have got it, you know. At the end of the day, you learn those are small things, but you have to help keep people in perspective. So treat them fairly, treat them with respect, and your reputation is the most valuable thing I can keep, and it's worth more than any given deal, you know, transaction, person, you know, and especially in a small town. I mean... I even have to do everything I can to treat tenant-occupied properties. Those tenants in there, I do everything I can to stay on their good side. You know, because it's small. They're going to talk, and who knows? They they could be my next buyer. Wow, I mean that's being humble. I mean, I, I think honestly, for me, if I was as successful as you were, I would I would not have that kind of humility. But I mean, that's probably one of the keys to your success. I'm going to throw a curveball in here a little bit, and I'm only asking you this because you know I know that you're into new media. And I, this is an opinion question. And how do you think sites like Zillow and Trulia are changing the way a transaction happens, the, the way that uh, a buyer, seller, and, and agent interact with one another? Uh, do you want my true opinion? I do. My honest opinion? Um, you know, on one of my video blogs, I talked about these sites because people use them. Now, again, my market is slightly different. If I was in a town with a lot of tract homes where they're all very similar, it, truly, it could be a good resource. If I'm looking to buy a house in Fresno and a tract with 5,000 homes and there's three plans, okay, the last two sales are probably a good indicator of value. Truly, I can extrapolate that and say, yeah, that's a, there's a $200,000 house. Here you go to Trulia, and I, you know, I use four examples. Like here's a house that on Trulia was worth one one, we sold it for one four. Wow. Um, here's a house that Trulia said was worth four sixty, it was on the market for six months, sold for three hundred. So. The, the, the sites are great. They provide information. They give us, as a consumer, what we want, instant information. Is it really that accurate? In my opinion, not really. But they, I think, have done quite well, and they're a good tool. But at the end of the day, it's like going online and trying to get a diagnosis. There, there's a time and a place to see a doctor. Um, and if you're just kind of curious, you know, what's this bump on my knee? Okay, I can look it up online. But at some point, if you're serious or there's a serious issue, then you need to see a professional. And, and, and so I haven't, I haven't seen a big impact from it. I see people use it as a point of reference, which I get. But it really, quite honestly, has not affected my business. Sometimes I have to counteract what people find on that website. Right. I would imagine that. What is something I did not ask you but I should have asked you? Well, um, Boy, I, I, I would say um, something you asked me that, <laughs> that you shouldn't have asked. Um, you, you know what? I, I think it, most importantly, uh, you, you've got to make this fun. Um, you know, I have a team now. So you start as an independent contractor. It's just you. You're doing everything. And then you have people come to work for you, and you have to decide what your culture is. And that's not something you decide overnight. So I, I you know, what are the most successful businesses in the per world? Where do people like to go? Um, and so, like Starbucks, great. The people are having fun. The breezes, the the smell, everything about it is a culture. It's an environment. So we we try to create that same environment, and we're always working on that. I mean, I have appraisers that call me, and they want to know what the values are, the comps. We do everything we can to provide the information they want, get all the details, so their job is easier. And guess what? 
those are the same people when they're coming to appraise one of our properties that if a little problem comes up, they just don't slam us with the appraisal and say, oh, sorry, I came in too low. They'll call us and say, hey, I'm having a challenge. Can you help me out? And we help mitigate problems by doing that. So I think it's just creating that culture uh, between me and everybody that works here so that we stand above and beyond other people so that we're kind of the Starbucks, we're kind of the Cadillac, so to speak, of, of service and interaction with our clients. Culture first. I love that. Well, we're at the lightning round, and uh, I'm going to ask you three quick, four quick questions. One. Okay. If you could recommend only one book, if I had 25 bucks, what book would you tell me to buy? And I'm in real estate. Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. Awesome. Do you have an internet tool like an Evernote that you're in love with? I don't, just the video blog. What are the first three steps a new agent should begin building his business with in the next 10 days? So these are just action items of I'm brand new, I got my license. What are the first three things I should do? write out a plan, get a coach or a mentor, mm -hmm. to keep track of what you're doing. Keep track. How would I find a mentor, Hal? How would I go about finding a good mentor? Because I know, you know, well, Mike, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, Mike Ferry is, is a coach of yours, but you know, I'm, I'm a new agent. I don't have money to pay a Mike Ferry. Um, find a successful agent and just see what they do and then try to get to, I mean, it, it's, I would put it this way, Toby, in terms of finding a mentor or a coach, okay, if you're going to open any business or let's say you want to be a professional basketball player and you have the opportunity to have Phil Jackson, famous coach of the Lakers and the Bulls, or a high school coach, you know, you can probably learn a bit with the high school coach. There's nothing wrong there and there's always insights. Everybody can coach me on everything. If I give them the opportunity, there's something I can learn from everyone, but why not go to go to the best if you really want to go to the highest level. Can you do it day one? Maybe not, but you can read about it. You can go online. There's things to search. So find the best person. Find the person that is your mentor in that aspect of your life, being business or real estate, and that's very important to do in the beginning. That is great advice. And I, and I guess at some level you could use uh, your, your notion of customer development around uh, mentor development. Absolutely. Yeah, there's always going to be people we can learn from, always. Give us one piece of parting advice and let us know where we can find you, and we'll sign off. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, so you can go to my website, which is team, like a basketball team, T-E-A-M, Swayze, which is S-W-E-A-S-E-Y dot com, or simply call my office. At, that's area code 805-781-3750, 805-781-3750. And, and just San Luis Obispo County, which is about a... 100 miles north of Santa Barbara, halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco on the coast. And one piece of parting advice? Parting advice? Um, you know what? Do what Tony Robbins says. Carve out a life you want. Don't settle. Awesome. Well, hey, this has been a fantastic interview. You're really easy to talk to, and I appreciate you taking the time out. My pleasure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, you heard it, folks. That was Hal Swayze on why you should focus on your sales skills and always follow up. Hal suggests you go out and find a mentor, build those uncomfortable relationships, and design the life you want. I hope that you can take one thing away from this interview and implement it in your business today. If you have enjoyed this session as much as I have, please go to iTunes and subscribe and give us a review and rating. If you'd like to keep getting these free mastermind sessions, please tell your friends and help us to continue growing our audience. Until next time. I'm Toby Salgado, and I personally thank you for listening to Super Agents Live. You ready? Let's go! Yeah!